to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ the apostle paul said i discipline my body and bring it into subjection lest when I've preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 27. We welcome you to our study of the book of 1 Corinthians. Today we're going to be studying 1 Corinthians chapters 9 and 10 as we're thinking about the Apostle Paul making sure that he himself is not disqualified from running the Christian race and also encouraging the Corinthians to do the same. As always, we want to encourage you to locate your Bible if you have it handy. And uh, we want you to know that today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Churches of Christ. Friend, the Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday, they'd be happy to have you for Bible study or worship. And you'll find people there who love God, who love lost souls, and who are interested in helping people with their journey to know God and His Word better. Also, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. We encourage you to access our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From our website, we have a wide variety of good Bible study materials. We have study questions, we have transcripts, video, audio lessons, and the good news is it's all available free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, whether that be on audio or video, we'll make that available to you free of charge. You can call us or email us or write us. We'll be glad to send that to you. And friend, don't forget to check out our apps for your phone. Both for the Android and iPhone, we have apps available from the App Store, and that is a great way to study the Word of God on the go. As we think today about the book of 1 Corinthians, Paul is going to be discussing his own self-denial, his own keeping himself in check and making sure that he's running the race right and that he doesn't discourage others from doing the same thing as well. In chapter 9, he's going to discuss some of the re relationship and responsibility he has as a, an apostle and a preacher of the gospel and how there are certain things that are right for him as a preacher but that he doesn't always use because it might be a stumbling block. And so Paul begins in verse number 14 by noting that gospel preachers do have a right to be paid, even though Paul himself may not have always used that right. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 14 with me. Even so, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should live from the gospel. Friend, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a gospel preacher. Uh, we see the same thing for elders in 1 Timothy chapter 5 with them living from the gospel, meaning they have a right to be paid. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 tells us that those who are taught the word should, should share in all good things with him who teaches the word. Going back to Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 4 where we realize that you must not uh, muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain. That is, that animal that was working in the field uh, to help the farmer bring in the crop had every right to stop every now and then and eat some of that crop as well. well what's the whole point of that? The one who's preaching and teaching the gospel has the right to live by and be paid from the teaching of the message. Now, understand this as well. While it's the case that gospel preachers and teachers have a right to be paid for that, friend, that's not something they have to do. Paul chose not to do that at times. And we're not talking about living some uh, lavish lifestyle 
that is high, living in big mansions. Drive. We're not talking about someone living some lavish lifestyle that others don't live. That, that, that's not the idea here. It ought to be good and fair and right and what's in keeping with the standards of the time. But realize there is a right in doing that. Paul also notes from this context that he had a right to be married as a preacher as well. Can a preacher be married? Well, absolutely. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 5 and 6. Do we have no right to take along a believing wife, as do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working, Whoever goes toward his own expenses, who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit, or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock. And so again, Paul talks about the idea of, of gaining a salary from that, but he also mentions these words. Do we not have a right to lead along a believing wife, as do Cephas and the other apostles? You see, we know that Peter was married. From 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter was an elder, and from 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1, an elder has to have a wife. That's part of the qualifications as well. And so when we think about preachers and some of the things that, that they have to think about and deal with, they can be paid, this text teaches us that, and they can be married. Now, friend, let, let's realize this. In the religious world, and especially as it relates to Catholicism and, and other religious groups that are related to that, to that, sometimes we'll note them teach and maybe the idea that they've got to remain celibate, that they refer to them as priests or whatever they may be, that they're not to have a wife. Well, friend, that's foreign to the teaching of the Bible. In fact, both Peter in 1 Peter chapter 5 and Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 5 and 6, taught they had a right to lead along a believing wife. And so the idea that a, a preacher, someone who works for the, the church or something like that can't be married, friend, that's not taught in the scriptures. In fact, if we can say in all kindness, a lot of the problems that have been related to sexual problems for those who may have been taught that you had to remain celibate, friend, a lot of that would have been dealt with a long time ago incorrectly if we'd only gone by what the Bible teaches. There is a right and proper way to deal with those emotions. Hebrews 13, 4 says, Marriage is honorable, the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. There's nothing wrong with a gospel preacher, any person who works in the church being married, that's the way it ought to be. Elders, same way. And friend, that would have taken care of a whole lot of problems. Instead of going by the tradition of men, if we would have gone by what the Bible teaches in those areas. Now, let's notice another principle that Paul really uh, drives home from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and it's this. If I'm going to win the race of Christianity, I've got to have the mindset of winning. You know, no one who enters a race says, man, this is going to be a great race. I hope I come in second. No, that's not how you approach You don't say, boy, I'd love to come in last in this race. No, if you're going to win a race, you need that competitive mindset. I'm going to be a winner. I'm going to do my best and I'm going to win. Friend, the same principle is true with Christianity. I have got to have the mindset, I'm going to win this race. Notice what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, verse number 24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Now listen to this. Run in such a way that you may obtain it. What's Paul saying? Everybody who gets in a race runs. Uh, getting in the race doesn't really mean anything in essence. It's good that you're in the race. Don't take that the wrong way. But you need the mindset. If you're going to get the prize, you've got to run in such a way that I'm going to win. Friend, we all want to be in the race of Christianity. And we want to be in it in such a way that we can be winners in the end. And, and winning the race of Christianity is about crossing the finish line Faithfully, right? Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2, Paul said, Seeing then that we're surrounded 
by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily ensnare us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. How? Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And so when we think about running this race, friend, let's run it with endurance and let's stay focused on Jesus, who ought to be the focal point of that. Uh, Paul would say later about his own life in 2 Timothy 4, as his life came to a close, we hear these encouraging words in 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. Paul says, I fought the good fight. Listen to this. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Henceforth, in the future, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, but not to me only, to all those who've loved His appearing. Friend, as we think about this mindset, let's have the mindset that I'm going to be like the Apostle Paul. One of these days, I'm going to be able to say, I've finished the race. I've kept the faith. But friend, a big part of doing that, a big part of finishing the race is you've got to run with the prize in mind. Now, I don't always know what that prize might be, especially as we think about some big race, Boston Marathon, whatever it may be. Of course, the prize is the prestige of that. I'm sure there's prizes, a medal that goes along with that as well. When we think about the, the, the day in which the New Testament was written, the in a lot of the Greek games, which some of those go back to the history of the first Olympics, there would be a, a beautiful crown given to the runner. And every runner wanted to receive the notoriety and that crown. Well, friend, what's the prize in the Christian race? Paul reminds us in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 13, when he talks about that prize, keeping our eyes on the uh, prize of heaven. Paul says, not that I've already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. I do not count myself of apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the prize of what? Of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What is that call? That call that one day we all hope to hear, right? Well done. Don't you want to hear these words one day? Here's the call and the prize. When the Lord, when we stand before God in judgment and we hear these words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joys of your Lord. Isn't that why we're running the race? Don't you want to go to heaven more than anything in the world? Don't you want to be there with God? Be with the Lord Jesus Christ and live in that beautiful place where there be no more sorrow, pain, death, and crying, all the, the former things that passed away? If so, run the race in such a way that you'll win it. Have the mindset. Friend, this is such an important part of what we're talking about today. When you become a Christian, you've got to have the mindset, I'm going to be faithful unto death. Revelation 2 verse 10, no matter what gets in the way, no matter what stumbling block the devil tries to throw in front of me, no matter what challenges or difficulties may arise, no matter what come, I'm never going to give up. I'm going to do everything I can to say like the Apostle Paul, I've kept the faith, I've finished the race. And friend, a big part of finishing the race is self-discipline. Any runner or any kind of athlete knows that as it gets difficult and as you begin to wear out physically, to overcome that, a big part of it is overcoming self and your own urge to quit. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9 verse number 27. Such a powerful statement to hear these words from the Apostle Paul. But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I've preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. What does Paul mean, I discipline my own body? Well, again, think about the illustration here of a runner. If you've ever done any long distance running, you know that before you hit your second wind, as we often refer to it, there's that point where your body's ready to shut down, where your lungs are to the point where they don't wanna go anymore, and where your mind says, okay, it's time to stop. How do you 
keep going? How do you hit that, that second wind, as it were? You've got to discipline your body. What's that mean? You've got to say, no, I'm not giving up. No, I'm not giving in. To the muscles, you've got to say, we're keeping going. To your lungs, we're going to keep pulling in. you just got to say to yourself, let's, let's bring it all together and let's press on. Well, Paul makes that application to the spiritual. I discipline my body. I bring it into subjection. Why, Paul? Lest when I've gone out and preached to others, I myself should be come disqualified. Disqualified from what? Running the race. Paul's here talking about the spiritual and the need to control our body in the race. And friend, the lust of the flesh, the desires, the passions, the, the temptations that we all face. How are we going to run the race when we've got those coming in from every side? Friend, you've got to say no to self. Are there going to be times, are there times in my life and are there going to be times in your life when the temptation is strong and I think to myself, well, that sure would be nice. Or if I do this, nobody will know. Or why not give in just a little? That won't work. Paul says, especially as an apostle and a preacher, if I do that and then I go out and preach to people, hey, you can't do these things or don't live that way and I'm doing it myself, I'm already disqualified from running the race. And so we often hear it said, we need to live what we preach and teach. And friend, that's true for every Christian. Let's live and run the race in such a way that on that final day, we can hear those words. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of your Lord. Now, as we move into 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul is going to show us some examples of how we must not serve the Lord and how we must not give in to temptation. Notice 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to look in verses 6 through 10 with me. And this is the context of Israel, and they serve kind of as a negative example of what we ought not to do. Look in 1 Corinthians 10, beginning in verse number 6. Paul says, Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as some of them as it is written. The people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play, nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain as some of them also also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now, verse number 11. Now, all these things happened to them as examples. Now, listen. And they're written for our admonition upon whom the end of the ages have come. What exactly is it Paul's trying to get us to see here? Remember, Paul has been telling us, run the race in such a way that you can win. Uh, discipline your body and don't give in to these things. And then he kind of shows in chapter 10 an illustration of people who didn't do that. And he goes back to Israel and he says, don't lust after evil things like they did. What happened to Israel when they lusted after evil things? Think about the book of Judges for a moment and the cycle they went through. The people in the book of Judges would be close to God. Then they would begin to look at the other nations. They would covet what they had. They would be up on the hilltop worshiping, and they'd go into captivity. They would cry out to God. God would send a deliverer. That deliverer would release them from their captors, and they'd go back into serving God faithfully. And multiple times in the book of Judges, they did that. Why? Because they lusted after evil, and bad things happened. He says, don't become idolaters like they were. And friend, while we may not be out worshiping idols, isn't it the case that anything that takes first place over God can become our idol today? And then we also notice, he says, don't commit sexual immorality like some of them did and perish. Don't tempt the Lord. Uh, and here's such a practical one as well. Don't complain like they did. What can keep us from losing the race? Any of these. But you know one that we probably all need to be especially careful about is the idea of complaining. Do you ever complain? I guess that's kind of a rhetorical question of which we could probably all say, well, from time to time I do. You know, I understand when we have difficulties and challenges and all of us from time to time probably get caught up in that. 
But that's not something God wants us to do, especially in the realm of the spiritual. Philippians 2.14 says, Do all things without murmuring and complaining. Friend, when we complain spiritually, one of the things that we may not be realizing is we're complaining against God. We say, well, how's that the case? Isn't it the case that God has said all spiritual blessings are ours? In Christ Jesus, Ephesians 1 verse 3. Isn't it the case that God has promised to help us, to care for us, and to bless us with the things we need in this life? Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 following, 1 Peter 5 7, uh, Matthew 6 verse 24 through 33. When I begin to complain, do I realize in some ways I'm in essence like the people of Israel complaining against God? And friend, those people stand out as a, a marvelous and, at the same time, horrible example for me. What do I learn from the Israelites? I learn this. If they'd have only stayed true to God, if they'd have only not looked at the, the things of the world, if they'd have kept from getting involved in immorality and idolatry and complaining, so many more of them would have made it into the promised land. And friend, if I want to make it to the promised land, and I'll guarantee you, every person who loves God in the Bible does, let's take seriously the example of these people as it relates to running the Christian race in such a way that we can win. Then, friend, as we think about 1 Corinthians chapter 10, let's also realize that these people stand out as an example to us of not getting caught up in temptation nor in tempting God. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 following. Therefore, here's the application. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Friend, when I think about these people, there's a practical lesson. Lest we think we're so much better or more spiritual or they were just a weak people that we can't relate to, Paul says, now I've mentioned these people, and yeah, they had their problems, big problems. But he says this, let me talk to you just a minute, Christians. Therefore, take heed, lest ye fall. What's that mean? Don't think that you can't get into temptation also. Don't think that you can't fall into sin. Don't say to yourself, I am so much more spiritual. I am so much better. That'll never happen to me. Paul says, uh-uh. Here's what I want you to learn. Take heed, lest you fall. What's that passage teach? There's a present reality that if I don't keep running the race faithfully, if I don't maintain the mindset of a winner, if I don't discipline my body daily, and if I am not ever cognizant of the reminder that people in the Old Testament failed, that I can do the same thing as well. Now, friend, we're not preaching the idea that you're going to fail. But friend, let's realize the devil is an active enemy, right? The devil is doing everything he can to tempt us. The world is pressing in on us and trying to squeeze us into its mold. And if I'm not cognizant, if I'm not ever mindful of the fact, that yeah, if I'm not careful, I can lose my salvation. Then friend, you're right where the devil wants you to be. And let's also realize this. In being cognizant of that fact, there's another fact God wants us to be mindful of, and it's this. God's going to help us, and there's nothing that can overtake us that there isn't a way out. Listen to the beautiful words of 1 Corinthians 10, 13 again. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to men. You're not facing anything that people haven't faced before. But with the temptation, but God is faithful. There's your source of help. God is faithful who with the temptation will make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. 
Paul reminds us God's there to help us, and we must not give in. Now, there's one other verse in 1 Corinthians 10 that I want to remind us of that I think will, will help us as we try to run the race of Christianity, and the principle is this. Run the race in such a way that everything you do reflects beautifully on God. Listen to 1 Corinthians 10, verse number 31. The Bible says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Friend, I want to live my life in such a way that the Father is happy with me. You know, I know the Father was happy with His Son, Jesus Christ, for His voice boomed down from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. I want God's life. Uh, I want God to be happy with my life. I want to live my life in such a way that it brings honor and glory to God. And friend, I want to run the Christian race in such a way that God smiles down on my life and it brings honor and glory to Him. Friend, let's realize everything we do, whether we eat or drink, even small things, that's a reflection on the God whom we claim to serve. And so to every Christian today, our encouragement, our hope, the, the emphasis of our lesson today is run the Christian race and be a winner in the end. Don't let anything get in the way. Be motivated to, to follow the good examples in the Bible. And friend, be motivated every day by knowing your life reflects good on God. If you're not a child of God, as always, we want to encourage you to become a Christian. You're not in the race yet. You can't win it if you're not in it. But friend, you can become a Christian today. Have you obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ? If you've never become a Christian, we urge you to obey the gospel. Friend, if, have you heard the word of God? Romans 10 verse 17. Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the, the Son of the living God? Would you repent of sin in your life? Luke 13 3. Would you confess Jesus as Lord and Savior? Romans 10 verse 10. Would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins? Here's what the Lord said. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. Friend, we want you to know today that we're concerned about souls, that more than anything, we love you. We want you to go to heaven. And may God help each of us to run the race of life in such a way that we're winners in the end. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go. Gospel of Christ.